Hello, good morning. My name is Dr. Sharada Damaraju and I'm a neuropsychologist. I've been practicing for about 18 years and the last 12 years or so I've been working in long-term care facilities. Good morning. My name is Masami Junad. I am a psychologist as well. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So we wanted to talk this morning for a little while about health and wellness, especially, you know, in the times of actually very difficult times with the pandemic going on. Um, and I just wanted to start out to say, you know, when we think about health and wellness, I think the first thing that at least comes to mind a lot of, for a lot of people um, is, you know, we think about physical health. We think about, you know, what's going on, you know, are we feeling good today? Are we feeling bad today? Do we have aches? Do we have pains? Um, you know, those kinds of things are what I think about when I think about health and wellness, you know. Um, but I think it's important to also consider that health and wellness also, it, it incorporates emotional wellness, you know. Um, we seldom think about our emotional health when we hear those terms. So um, the two kind of go hand in hand, you know, emotions as well as physical all go hand in hand. Um, so we think about that what we call the mind-body connection. Um, and that's the idea that our emotional functioning can affect our physical functioning. So if we're feeling stressed out in any way, um, or we're feeling sad or anxious, or, you know, we may actually experience symptoms that are manifested within our body, believe it or not. Um, so they can present as different things um, within our body so, for example, GI issues. Um, you know, we may experience some stomach discomfort or indigestion or, you know, sometimes we may have some um, reflux issues that come up. Um, any other things that you'd like to add, Dr. Janan? Oh, like, don't, you mean you've got feelings? Yeah, anything that, you know. Anything that it's related to mind and body? Yeah. Or GI issues. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on that okay. you know? So when she mentioned about the mind-body connection, the easiest way for me to understand is, I'm thinking about something sad, like some sad thoughts, and then the next thing I find myself crying. Mm -hmm. So the thought actually um, influences how I might react. Right. And so the good example was GI issues. And another thing that personally I might see different is. I don't feel like eating anymore. Nothing mm -hmm. interests me. You know, I'm a big, <laughs> um, a sweet fan, but all of a sudden I don't care right. if I stop at the supermarket to pick up a bag of chocolate. And I find myself, oh, I'm not really eating anymore. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you know, you might find that you're eating a whole bunch. You know, you're seeking out those comfort foods, mm -hmm. they say, that are so bad. Um, so, you know, any changes in appetite that can also be an indication of a reaction to stress. Um, also just physically, you know, um, symptoms of fatigue, you know, not wanting to get up and, you know, you just want to stay in bed all day. Um, just feeling tired all the time, you know, that's another reaction possibly to stress. Yeah, typically I hear um, some of my clients here says, I feel lousy. It's just I don't feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. And the next thing that I typically hear is about pain. I don't feel good. I have pain in my shoulder or my back hurts, my leg hurts. I don't know if it's arthritis or something, but it just hurts. Yeah, yeah. Headache. Headaches are big, big, big stressors. Do you, you've heard the term stress headache? It exists. <laughs> um, so that's something else to keep in mind and, you know, um, in terms of just physical symptoms, you know, yes, they can be related to stressors. They can be related to our emotional functioning. But it is very important, I think, to rule out any medical contribution to any of the symptoms before, you know, we consider that it's solely related to our emotions. So, you know, always having checkups with your physicians, you know, ruling out anything that might be um, anything symptomatic is a good idea before we start to take on the next idea that oh you know there is nothing physically going on why am i having these symptoms so then we look at the next step and so 
So there are a couple of more things that I wanted to add. Sure. Um, the increase or decrease of sleep. Uh, another symptoms might be poor concentrations. You find yourself becoming more forgetful or not being able to focus. Those are the things that I might find um, as a sign. And all of a sudden feeling like lots of guilt. I don't know where it's coming from, but I just don't feel like I'm doing enough and something's mm -hmm. not quite right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so talking about stressors, you know, it's, it's a pretty broad term. You know, what is stress? Well, stress can be different things to different people, right? <laughs> Um, and also, you know, right now is a time when we may be experiencing several stressors at one time. And that's a lot for anybody to, to manage. Um, and so they're relative. And they can also come and go. I mean, this week might be a less stressful week, but then next week something happened and we're feeling more stressed. Um, so just wanted to just review a few of the common stressors um, especially right now um, during a difficult time. So the big one <laughs> is actually related to the fact that we are speaking with you with our masks on. <laughs> um, so the, you know, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is um, definitely a huge stressor for many of us right now. It has changed basically everything, you know, as we've known it, especially but in um, a place like this, in, in terms of, you know, the kind of people who reside here and the kind of care that we provide, we provide supportive care to people in long-term care facilities, we've noticed a lot of changes. Um, one is, I never thought I'd be going to work having to wear a mask all day long. Um, and also just, you know, the change with how we're all reacting you know, fear of getting sick. You know, every day I go in and I say, hmm, I do a check. I say, how do I feel today? I don't think I'm sick. I have allergies. Is that COVID? Like, so sort of just like, you know, a fear factor about do we have it? Um, that's one thing that's, I think, causing a lot of stress. And then also, secondarily, somebody that we, you know, or one of our loved ones, are they sick? Do they have it? You know, and how are they going to manage? Um, so these are things that come to mind, mm -hmm. do you and have also other? facility has different guidelines. Tomorrow, we may not be able to leave our rooms. Today, I'm able to have a visitors. Mm -hmm. So rules change every day, and it's very difficult to cope for both residents as well as family yeah. who lives outside of the community as well. And also the staff members. In some areas, we were supposed to follow this guidelines, but in the other area, we have a little bit more um, easy way of coping. So again, it does change every single day, and we have to be on top of that to protect ourselves and community people. And also just about the masks, I know um, the mandates keep changing, and where you live, you know, affects the mandates. And then, um, you know, Last year, mid last year, it was okay for us to have a cloth mask, you know, when we went out and about. They said, oh, you know, it'll keep you from getting sick and, you know. Um, but now we're at a point where they're recommending that we wear N95 masks or KN95 masks. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to a whole nother, you know, secondary issue of, I know many people that say that the wearing the mask actually, um, causes them to have trouble breathing. Well, if you're having trouble breathing, that's pretty stressful, I would think. Um, and I can say, you know, from wearing a mask for several hours a day, which I'm sure many of us can attest to this, it really, you know, by the end of the day, I'm thirsty, I have a headache, and, you know, different reactions come about from that. So that's a high stress situation in general that we're all encountering. Um, and, and then, then, go ahead. And also, it's very difficult to feel personal. Too. Yes. Um, a lot of times people like to see our face so that they could tell if we're uh, being friendly and mm -hmm. also some people like to read lips but it's very difficult to do so. Right. And also seeing other people who may not be so keen on following the rules can provoke some emotional distress as well. 
So we are smiling from time to time underneath our mask, by the way, as we're presenting, just so you're aware. <laughs> um, so job, job stressors, you know, things have changed remarkably. Um, we hear it all the time. I watch the news. There are a lot of staffing issues in, in many settings, not just in hospital settings, in long-term care facility settings. Um, it seems to be a global issue. And so that may affect you know, how we have to work, you know, we may have to put in some extra hours or, you know, there may be some um, changes to financial, you know, um, issues. Like we, we may not be making as much money as we may have, especially, you know, some of these businesses, you know, they're just not generating the kind of, you know, um, income that they had expected because of the pandemic. So another huge source of stress for people, you know, where's that money going to come from? Um, I think, you know, also work-life balance has really, really changed. <laughs> um, there was a time when, you know, after work, I might go out to a restaurant or, you know, whatever. I, I can say that I've changed how I um, approach, you know, things that I like to do to relax. I used to be out a lot more than I probably am now. How about you? Yes, I usually just come to work, mm -hmm. do my work, and then go home. So I don't expose myself to other potential um, viruses out there. So yes, um, I'm spending more time at home. Okay. Yes, and then another thing that I wanted to add here is about relationships. Relationships can be very stressful. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, we've been talking about this pandemic and yes, there are um, people who are fortunate enough to be here together, but there are other families whose spouse might be outside mm -hmm. in the community and they may have uh, other illnesses or something that, that might um, make resident here worry so much, but they're not able to offer help or um, provide support because of this regulation or pandemic uh, related restrictions. And when you hear about your daughter or your son's getting um, surgery or suffering from cancer, for instance, just the thought of it will really um, worry somebody. And I, I personally am aware so many of my clients express they feel helpless and that feeling is just too much to deal sometimes. So that kind of brings us, you know, to the fact that there are so many stressors we're all stressors that we are all you know dealing with and from an emotional standpoint our emotional response to stress may vary also you know um some people may get depressed you know that's their reaction is to get depressed you know some of the signs of that are you know feeling sadness um not having interest in activities or in things that they normally would have um no motivation to do things, you know, um, appetite changes, mm -hmm. sleep changes, you know, you may not eat, you may eat a lot, you may not sleep, you may sleep excessively. Um, these are all, you know, issues that come up from an emotional standpoint and um, also just anxiety can be something else, you know, we worry a lot and there's a lot to worry about for sure right now, but, um, you know, sometimes it can be debilitating. You know, there's normal anxiety about things and we're able to still function, but there's also anxiety that can debilitate us to the fact that we can't even, you know, get up and do our usual things. We may feel like, you know, our heart rate is elevated. We may not be able to breathe. We may even hyperventilate because we're so worried and scared. Um, just other personality changes and irritability, mood swings. Um, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, so all of a sudden, um, mm -hmm personality changes. Not not to a significant degree, but the person who used to be much more fun and outgoing all of a sudden started to feel like, um, I don't want to be bothered. So, yeah. So, these emotional responses, you know, they can be a result of, you know, feeling out of control. Um, so not knowing when the pandemic is going to end, I think is a huge source of emotional distress for us right now. Um, and then again, just this ongoing, you know, continuous worry of, will we get sick? You know, will our loved ones get sick? Um, I, <laughs> as I've gotten older, 
I've had these issues with allergies in the winter time. I never had allergies in the winter time, but I had a sore throat a few days ago and I thought, oh my gosh, I have COVID, you know, and that was my immediate reaction. So I went and I got tested and then I tested myself again because I wasn't convinced <laughs> that I didn't have it. So I did two tests within, you know, 48 hours because I had a sore throat. I mean, three years ago, four years ago, sore throat would have just been like, oh, I have a sore throat, but it, it means something different now. And I had to double check that I was okay. And especially with the work that I do and coming into, you know, a place and seeing lots of people. Um, so it turned out, yes, it was just some kind of weird <laughs> allergic reaction as, uh, that I got. So, um, how we view illness is so different now than, you know, years ago. And the other thing too, is I can remember, um, if I had a head cold, I would just take some Sudafed or something and suck it up and come to work. And that was that, you know, now any kind of, you know, change in how I feel physically, it sends an alert sign. And that's an emotional reaction. Like I, I get, I was anxious. Was I sick? Um, yes. And then also hearing from facility that we have to test you um, every other day or on mm -hmm. a particular day. And there's an exposure on your building. Um, all those information is very scary. Yeah. And then sometimes what if you are told that you unfortunately tested positive? And that cause negative thoughts in some people. If they're already suffering from other illnesses, unfortunately, that could contribute to another mm -hmm. factor. See, there's no point of um, trying. I'm sick anyway. Right. So that comes to, you know, the next sort of phase of just talking about, you know, yes, we, we ha our emotions can cause physical symptoms. You know, stressors can cause our emotional symptoms. And we all cope in different ways, you know? I mean, and here's the thing about the coping is that we may not be coping in the best ways, you know? We may be <laughs> sort of resorting to maladaptive coping strategies right now because that's the only way that we know how. We never were, you know, taught anything different. Um, so for example, you know, there's been so many advertisements on the television about, um, different wine companies and things. They deliver cases of wine. And so, you know, some people might be coping with drinking excessively, you know? They have to make sure, like when the supermarkets were closing, that wasn't a big deal to them. It was, we gotta make sure we have our wine in case we're stuck in the house. And, you know, so that was a huge way that a lot of people coped. They had to make sure that they had their alcohol in the house. But let's face it, you know, excessively drinking alcohol it's not the best coping strategy because it can lead to so many other secondary, you know, issues with like from a physical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, and you know, it's a depressant. And so it may actually make people feel worse, believe right. it or not. Um, you want to? Or eating too much or too little. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about unhealthy eatings, eating particular uh, snacks only. Yeah. Um, but strange time of the day also not not following the three meals a day schedules but you know eating really late at night and just binging on something ice cream or just or energy drinks i had one client who said i'm drinking my ensure so i'm okay <laughs> but you cannot sustain on one particular type of uh, diet supplement and smoking is another thing I've noticed mm -hmm. uh, there we do have options now so some people who used smoking before turn to smoking to cope with their anxiety yeah yeah and smoking again if you are already experiencing anxiety and those types of symptoms it will increase heart rate and you know it will absolutely exacerbate breathing issues and things like that. So that's not a good coping um, strategy either. Um, so <laughs> I laugh at this one. Television, watching television, but binge watching television. You've heard the term binge watching Netflix. <laughs> I mean, you know. Did you do it? <laughs> in the very beginning I might have, but then I said, this is just ridiculous. So <laughs> it's not, it doesn't serve a purpose because Literally, you're just sitting there in front of the TV and 
not doing anything else. Um, so yeah, that's another coping strategy. A lot of people are still doing that. Um, and, and I think early on during the pandemic, it was very common because a lot of the businesses were closed. You know, we were not able to get out and do things. Um, so that kind of leads to, you know, it's very easy to get ourselves in a sort of disrupted sleep wake cycle. So if you stay up till three, four in the morning watching television or Netflix, then you fall asleep at five o'clock in the morning and then you sleep until like noon or two o'clock in the afternoon, guess what? And you do that repeatedly, you've now shifted your sleep wake cycle so that when you're, you know, when other people are awake doing their everyday things, you're asleep in bed. Um, and it's very unproductive. So, you know, that's something else. Uh, and then that can lead to just not getting dressed the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, you not can... taking shower, not mm -hmm. taking care of yourself. Yes. Yep. So you don't brush your teeth, you don't wash your hair, you know, and you start to become unkempt. And, mm -hmm. and that too can lead to issues. You know, if you're not clean, that you can absolutely get rashes and different things like that. So these are all secondary and they're maybe on the extreme side in some cases, but it's still, um, I think, important and to, to raise these issues because I do believe that quite a few people may be experiencing these kinds of, you know, situations and coping in this manner. Um, so that kind of leads us to... <laughs> the positive coping strategy. Yeah. So alternatively, some positive ways of coping with a difficult situation and these stressors right now. Um, I would think about a healthy diet or regular exercise mm -hmm. or having you know plenty of sleep for myself. Yeah. Um, I think you know, getting some fresh air, mm -hmm. um, getting some sunshine. I think these are all factors that can help to improve mood, even if it's for you know 15 minutes. You just spend some time outside. Um, I like to take my dog out for a walk. You know, sometimes he fights me and he doesn't want to go out for a walk, but especially in the cold, but I, you know, I suit him up. He has a coat and, and, you know, sometimes I don't feel like doing it, but inevitably when I cut back from my walk, I feel better. And I know he feels better too. <laughs> um, also, some, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, some people can do like a chair yoga or stretching in the mm -hmm. room. And yeah. meditation and I also believe the religious meetings or uh, support group yeah um, or services attending services I think that's very wonderful yeah and then also just connecting with family you know and even if it's by phone you know you may not be able to see family if they're far away or something but I think that um, connecting with family it helps and friends too it really does help to um, to minimize loneliness during a time when it's easy to isolate from other people, you know. Um, and this goes for people, you know, there's so many people who live alone and who don't have that support and, you know, unless we kind of nudge them, they, they may actually stay there and just say, I'm okay, you know, and that's not the best way either. Um, so setting limits around drinking alcohol, you know, it's, people like to drink socially, it's, you know, it's fine. Just keeping an eye on how much, because if it adversely affects you, that is something to consider. Um, you know, you, you want to definitely look at that. Um, you were talking about the healthier eating, just small changes is what I would think about. It's always difficult to do some drastic change. So let's say you drink like three cups of coffee a day, maybe cut down to two cups, you know, something smaller. Um, same thing with, uh, just sweets. You mentioned about the bag of chocolates and maybe substituting a fruit one day instead of eating the candy, you know. Small things like that. It doesn't have to be anything big, but um, the impact on how you feel emotionally, physically may, you know, it may be better, you may feel better off it, and you may notice a change if you're doing some of these small changes consistently over time. Um, and then having the um keeping a things to do list to organize your thoughts. This is something that some of my clients have said is helpful because we try to think like we have to remember, we have to remember, but it's difficult to keep up with all those thoughts in head. So if you are able to write down, that itself will give you a visual aid as well as sense of um, organization. 
Yeah, I think that um, structure is very helpful um, when you feel out of control about a situation because it harnesses it and it says, okay, you know, instead of all these different thoughts and everything all over the place, it's actually confined to a list that you can actually check off and say, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. And that helps to reduce anxiety overall. Um, and some other things that I thought about mm -hmm. was music or work on your hobby. Sometimes people might like to do puzzles or knitting mm -hmm. or photography or read a good book. Um, whatever that they used to do doesn't have to be stopped just because you're confined in a room. I think it's wonderful if you can start doing something that gave you some pleasure. Yeah. So I had, I, I actually applied that to myself. <laughs> I actually started to knit again and I worked on a knitting project for my mother-in-law and I'm almost finished it and that was after like 10 years of not doing any knitting but it's actually a nice feeling because it's pretty. <laughs> so we talked about you know some of the maladaptive coping strategies, some of the positive coping strategies and emotional symptoms. The thing we wanted to just bring up next is you know when to seek help actually you know, because we're all experiencing this at different levels, you know, but some people are, you know, coping better than others. And so for those people who may not have good coping strategies or who are really emotionally, you know, experiencing a lot of symptoms right now, you know, when, when is it important to seek help? Um, so the way, you know, how we sort of visualize that is, if the symptoms, if the emotional and the physical symptoms persist beyond, say, a couple of weeks, and they're also interfering with daily activities, um, it may be time to seek some professional help. And we mentioned we're both psychologists. You know, psychologists are doctors who provide support to people when they're experiencing emotional symptoms. And so they may help identify the source of the symptoms and work with people on reducing those symptoms um, through various strategies. So the focus of the treatment is specific to the person. Um, and so a common way to find a psychologist is to actually contact your health insurance company to find providers within your network. And I'd like to add just one more. Lately, if you are on um, social media or television, all those commercials actually putting all those ads about uh, mental health and sign up for those programs, sign up for those uh, therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. Telehealth. Telehealth. Yeah. Um, yes, it is very convenient that some of us are now able to reach out to people at home. However, please make sure to check in to see what type of service is available because sometimes services might be reasonable in price but does not mean the person that might be offering services is well educated or skilled enough to provide the services of your own need. She or he might be good fit for somebody else but please identify what is the purpose or what you are looking for first and then see if the a company or therapist is able to provide such services and if it's not the good fit as a consumer you have a right to ask for a different a person or change so please do not settle with somebody that you don't feel comfortable exactly and we don't take it personally <laughs> no we don't because it's about um, you know Dr. Janan mentioned it's about the relationship and if you don't click with somebody then it's very difficult to work with that yes. person for positive change for yourself. And after all, it's about you and your personal, you know, health and wellness and, you know, being the best that you can be. So, I think that concludes our presentation and we wish you a happy, healthy, safe, you know, new year and uh, we hope that uh, more positive changes are on the horizon for all of us. Good morning. My name is Eileen Bratton. And I'm here to talk a little bit about infection control, specifically masks, not wearing them like this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so here we go. Um, my first point that I, I want to talk about is why is mask wearing important and how is the mask worn correctly? So this is incorrect. The better way to wear it is up over the nose and under the chin so it covers the nose and the mouth making sure that the nose piece 
is um, molded appropriately to the nose and that there are not a lot of gaps on the side um, because that really just takes away the whole purpose and importance of wearing a mask. The other thing that's important to remember is, and it's, it's a hard concept, um, but almost two years in I would hope that we're a little bit better at it, is the constant touching it, uh, fixing it, that is not helpful. If you do that a lot, you have to remember what is so totally important is hand washing. We talk about masks so much and sometimes we forget uh, the two other aspects of, I will remove this, of um, good infection control and that, that is hand washing. And appropriate hand washing is done uh, 20 seconds at a time. We tell in education classes, we tell folks to sing to themselves or out loud, whichever is easiest, um, happy birthday twice. And that takes about 20 seconds. Um, many years ago, uh, when we first started uh, teaching hand washing and making sure hand washing was a critical part of our infection control education, we would tell folks to um, sing Yankee Doodle Dandy. That takes about 20 seconds. And what we found was not a lot of people knew all the words to Yankee Doodle Dandy. So they would start and they'd be like, Yankee Doodle went to 20 seconds. So we went back to singing happy birthday twice and that does take about 20 seconds and that's good hand washing. Um, and there's never a limit as to the number of times you can wash your hands during the day. The other thing with um, masks, hand washing, uh, another piece that is so totally important um, with controlling the spread of infection, specifically COVID, is social distancing. We were really good at this initially. We had a lot of markings on the floors and in elevators and at the supermarkets, but that's kind of gone to the wayside a little bit. A um, few months back, maybe, maybe even a year back, um, they said we could limit it from six feet to three feet. But as we've had these surges with COVID, it's probably best to go back to those six feet. So when you're in the supermarket and um, you're, you know, you're in line, you, you keep your distance and you hopefully the people behind you will keep their distance as well. In the elevators, they're over in Pathways, we have signs that say only two people to an elevator. Some of the elevators in our facility are small, so you know, it only can accommodate two people and keep that social distance. So certainly don't get in a, an elevator with a large group of people, just keep it to two. Um, and when you're in the elevator, that's not the time to take your mask down. It's a closed area, keep your mask up until you get to your, to your apartment. So um, I, I will go off the grid a little bit, um, but I will read some as well. Uh, so a mask is not a substitute for social distancing. Masks are in addition. Masks should completely cover the nose and mouth, as I said, and fit smugly against the sides of the face. Basically, everyone over two years of age should wear a mask in a public setting and when around people who don't live in their household. It's suggested to wear a mask in your home if someone you live with is sick with symptoms of COVID or, or who have tested positive. The CDC mandates masks to be worn on planes, trains, buses and other forms of public transportation. Um, as I said, the, uh, the uh, social distancing is still a recommendation that is in place. And, um, if there, and as I said, there's not as much signage around about it, but you can still continue to practice that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19, the virus, and how it spreads. It spreads from person to person through respiratory droplets. These respiratory droplets travel in the air when you cough, sneeze, talk, shout, or sing. The droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are near you, or people can breathe them in, and that's how it's spread. So masks are simply a barrier to help prevent your respiratory droplets from reaching others, and studies have shown, and there's been a lot of studies done during these past couple years, uh, that masks reduce the spray of droplets when worn over the nose and mouth appropriately. So masks do work. A um, little bit about those droplets. They can suspend in the air for minutes for, or up to hours, uh, and the risk of transmission is greatest within three to six feet. So that's why 
that um, six feet of social distancing is very important. As well as, along with that, a prolonged um, exposure greater than 15 minutes. So if you're with someone that may be sick, may be getting sick, um, being with them longer than that 15 minutes is something that these studies have shown um, is not, not the best thing. Um, so you should wear a mask even if you don't feel sick because people with COVID who never develop symptoms and they're referred to as asymptomatic or those who are not yet showing symptoms and they are known as pre-symptomatic can still spread the disease or the virus, I'm sorry. Um, and it's believed that you can become sick with COVID anytime between 2 and 14 days after exposure. And day 5 seems to be the most popular time when a person after exposure will turn positive. So again, the main function of wearing a mask is to protect those around you in case you're infected but not yet showing symptoms. Um, Another question that comes up quite a bit is how long should a person isolate when they do have a positive diagnosis? Current recommendation is 10 days of isolation from symptom onset if your symptoms are mild to moderate. Certainly if you have severe symptoms, you should consider staying isolated for up to 20 days. Uh, we currently over in Pathways, and I'll refer to Pathways a lot because that's where my home base is. Um, we when COVID first um, became a popular word over there, um, we isolated persons that were positive for 20 days and now we are at 10. So, um, and I, I think that's, that's an okay thing. Um, 20 days isolating folks really took its toll on people. And I know um, Char spoke a little bit about that, but um, even 10 days, we start to see the effects of people um, not being able to socialize as much, not being able to eat in a community setting, not seeing people for long periods of time. Um, so fortunately, not only we recognize that, but the Centers for Disease Control, that CDC, and the people that are making these recommendations see that as well and fortunately are making the appropriate changes. Um, another question that I wanted to bring up and just talk about briefly is how long should you wear a mask if you're only walking around the PPH campus or if you go off campus? So if you are inside a building, when you come out of your apartment, the mask goes on appropriately over the nose and the mouth and should stay on until you return to your apartment. I know there are folks that get together and maybe play cards and do some, some other things in very small gatherings. Please, I encourage you to keep your masks on during those times. The only times really masks should be off is when you're eating. Um, and then, of course, back on afterwards. Um, it's, if the weather's a little bit warmer um, and you take a walk outside on campus, it's okay to have your mask off and breathe in that good fresh air. Um, if you're walking with somebody that lives with you in your apartment, it's okay to have your masks, masks off, but if you're with somebody walking that does not live in your apartment, that you know lives somewhere else, um, you should keep your mask on uh, while you're walking. Um, we can't ever be too careful. We can't let, I always tell um, folks, you can't let your guard down. Um, Today, we're doing better with COVID. We've learned so much. Um, when I reflect to this time last year when we were just starting to administer vaccines and people that were positive with COVID at that time were so very sick. And I look to, and I compare it to this time to now, um, so many people have been vaccinated and received their boosters. This, they're not as sick now. Um, which says a lot to me and it says that these vaccines have worked um, and continue to work and will continue to work. Um, so it's important not only that we continue with the vaccines but also to continue with those other things that are um, that we have in place masking, hand washing and social distancing. Um, cloth masks that comes up quite a bit. Is it okay to wear it? If so should I double it? 
Re recommended masks are surgical masks that fit appropriately. Um, other recommended masks are those made with breathable materials such as cotton. Masks made with tightly woven fabric that don't let a light shine through it. So if you hold it up to a window or a light and you can't see that light through it, that's an okay cloth mask to wear. Um, cl but cloth masks need to be cared for, so you need to wash them. Um, and once they get frayed and things like that, you don't want to continue to wear it. So again, the surgical mask is the better mask to wear, but when they're in short supply, if you have a uh, cloth mask that is um, a thicker cloth mask, not a thin cloth mask, mask um, that is appropriate, but again, keeping it clean. Your surgical masks, um, they're not meant for extended use. So once they get dirty inside, you know, sometimes we sneeze, we cough, um, they want to be, they want to be replaced frequently. Um, what I notice a lot is on the outside here, the, um, the fabric starts to fray a little bit and that's a good time to um, get a new mask. Um, the other, I don't see them as much now, but um, for a, a little bit I would see folks wearing those gaiters. They're typically a very thin material um, and they're not, not uh, one that will, will help decrease the spread of COVID, so that's not a recommended one. Scarves and ski masks are also not to be used in place of um, either surgical masks or um, cloth masks. Um, so multi-layer cloth masks block the release of the exhaled respiratory particles into the environment along with any microorganisms associated with them. Uh, cloth masks block most large droplets as well as fine droplets, which we see with COVID. Um, and they also, they can block 50 to 70% of droplets um, and they limit the spread of those not captured. So cloth masks are okay, again, and I'll repeat this again, as long as they're the thicker ones and they're not the thinner one that you can see light through. The other thing that, um, that we'll see a lot on ads are N95s. Now N95s are a respiratory mask. Um, they are in um, high demand for healthcare workers and frontline workers, EMTs, respiratory therapists. So, um, you know, we, we're kind of keeping them aside for, for staff. Um, as I said, an N95 is a respirator. It's a respirator protection device designed to achieve a very close facial fit. And typically, um, all staff in, in most healthcare facilities get fit tested for them so they wear an appropriate size um, N95. There's a lot of, I guess, counterfeit masks out there that are stamped N95 and they're not really N95. They don't do what an N95 does. Um, a true N95 or a KN95 would have the letters uh, N-I-O-S-H stamped on it and that N-I-O-S-H stands for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and that means it's an official one. So if you happen to see a mask around and it says that it's a KN95 or just a N95, just look around and see if those, no those letters are on there too. All right, so I think I answered the question, are surgical masks washable? No, they are not. They are to be disposed of once they're dirty or wet. The other thing that sometimes comes up is goggles or um, face shields. Are they to be used in place of masks? Goggles, no, because they typically only cover the um, eye area. Face shields, no, because the face shield, although they come down here, you can still, it doesn't block any of the droplets or molecules or microorganisms from, from coming down below the mask and landing on an area. So um, they are not in place of masking. People with beards. Um, we see some, some folks around with beards. What is recommended is n sometimes I see people wear them like this, especially if they have a mustache. And that, that's really not too good. So what is recommended is to wear one mask surgical mask and uh, you know sometimes the hairs down here and then put a cloth mask on top of it 
So the cloth mask will kind of hold this in place and um, it, it's a better idea to decrease the spread. Um, fortunately, we don't have those issues here. Um, this end. Um, treatments. Let me just briefly talk about treatments. So um, we've been able to uh, administer monoclonal antibodies to our some of our residents over in Pathways that have become positive, that have tested positive. Um, back in October when we had a surge, we were able to test or um, administer those to quite a few people. Um, at that time, the variant was the Delta variant and the antibodies were effective to that. Now they have it, um, now we're in the Omicron variant and they have, they, there is uh, monoclonal antibodies that are effective to, against that variant, uh, but it's, of course, with everything else, it's in a little bit of a short supply. So there are some um, regulations as to who can get them and um, the pharmacy that we partner with has been wonderful with getting us what we need, so we're very grateful for that. And the residents that do receive them really do very well very minimal um, side effects, no side effects really. Uh, what it is is about a 30 minute IV infusion of an antibody that's been synthetically made in a laboratory uh, just to help uh, boost their system. Um, and the other thing that's very exciting is there is a um, oral antiviral medicine that two manufacturers have been have made and it will be out for the general public very soon. I did check with our pharmacy uh, Monday, I guess I talked with Carmen, and they don't have it yet, but they're hoping to, they're on the list to receive them, so they're hoping to, um, that that will be helpful and um, we'll be able to get that to treat some of our, our folks that get it. It's kind of similar to with the flu, when someone has the flu, we uh, sometimes treat them with Tamiflu, which is an uh, oral uh, antiviral medication. Just helps to, it doesn't take it away, but it helps to lessen the symptoms that they may be having um, when they're ill and maybe lessen the course of their um, illness. So we'll keep everyone posted on that. It's really very exciting news and um, you know, our docs are all on board with making sure that we, whatever is out there to treat our residents on, all, on our whole campus, that we get that and make that available to them. So um, I just wanted to, to end with two little, two, I won't say little, two quotes um, from Martin Luther King. And as I was doing a little reading um, to prepare for this, I, I came across these and I thought, Wow, somebody brought me right to this one um, because it just fits uh, what we're talking about. And it, it says this, Science investigates, religion interprets. Science gives man knowledge, which is power. Religion gives man wisdom, which is control. Science deals mainly with facts. Religion deals mainly with values. The two are not rivals. So I have a few folks in my family I need to share that with, um, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, um, you know, they'll they'll get it a little bit. And I just thought, wow, what a what, how beautiful is that? And then lastly, um, this just was another beautiful um, um, thought from Martin Luther King: Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. So, just a few thoughts to share with you today. And uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to, to be a part of your program.